I remember uh, I was at the Red River Bible Conference uh, in where is that town in Minnesota? I think it's just over the border from uh, Fargo. Fargo. What's it called? Fargo. Yeah. And uh, I was the last speaker of the evening. David Hawking was right before me. And after he spoke, half the place emptied out. <laughs> so uh, I know you appreciated Roger's talk, but there still are some of you here, and I appreciate that. I want to just kind of do a little bit of a wrap up on um, some loose ends. Uh, I just want to mention the booklet, I think I've only got one or two left False Revival Coming, Holy Laughter or Strong Delusion. I remember specifically getting a letter from Roger when I was writing for a, a group in Berkeley, California, and Roger thanked me for writing that article, and I knew his name because he had written some good stuff, and it's just really a privilege to be here with Roger. I haven't seen him for a year and a half, and uh, these discernment conferences are, are sort of wearing down a little bit. Uh, they're, they're not as frequent, and uh, again, thank you for having us. It's uh, especially a group that's just sort of forming on its own for the first time, and to have a have a a conference like this is really pretty remarkable because I know a lot of churches that they just uh, they want to do it, but they don't. They don't actually pull it together. Um, I wanted to read something, and I wanted to urge you to download this um, from the internet. It's by Harry Ironside. Get my watch out. Make sure I stay on time. It's called Exposing, and Harry Ironside is a, he was the pastor at Moody Bible Church uh, from 1930 to 1948. It's called Exposing Error, Is It Worthwhile? I'll just read the two paragraphs. He said, objection is often raised by some sound in the faith regarding the exposure of error as being entirely negative and of no real edification. Of late, the hue and cry has been against any and all negative teaching, but the brethren who assume this attitude Forget that a large part of the New Testament, both of the teaching of our blessed Lord himself and the writings of the apostles, is made up of this very character of ministry, namely, showing the satanic origin and therefore the unsettling results of the propagation of erroneous systems, which Peter, in his second epistle, so definitely refers to as damnable heresies. Then he concluded by saying, Error is like leaven, of which we read a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Truth mixed with error is equivalent to all error, except that it's more innocent looking and therefore more dangerous. God hates such a mixture. Any error or any truth and error mixture calls for definite exposure and repudiation. To condone such is to be unfaithful to God and his word and treacherous to imperiled souls for whom Christ died. So the Bible is very clear that um, we are to, in Ephesians 5, it says we are to bring the things of darkness into the light. And Paul said, it's a shame that we have to do this. It's a shame we have to have conferences like this. But we need to because heresies must come. And we're proven by how we respond when these heresies come. And we're seeing so many in the church right now that it's, it's very uh, depressing. And yet, at the same time, it upholds and affirms everything that we were told in the Word of God. I wanted to read, uh, just also, there's been a lot of talk about the Catholic Church. I wanted to read to you from the 1990, and we hear from Rick Warren who talks about our Pope, and we're being told that now we have everything in common with the Catholic Church, there's no reason not to join up with them. This is the 1994 Catechism, which is the official source for Roman Catholic doctrine. Let us rejoice then and give thanks that we have become not only Christians, but Christ himself. Do you understand and grasp, brethren, God's grace toward us? Marvel and rejoice, we have become Christ. This is in the Catholic doctrine. That alone is enough reason to tell anybody who's telling you that we have a lot in common with the Catholic Church, that you want to stay away. But here's two others in the Catechism. For the Son of God became man so that we might become God. And the only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us sharers in his divinity, assumed our nature so that he made man might make men gods. I read that to a friend of mine who's a Catholic. She, she loves the Word of God. And I, I said, I'm going to read to you something from your catechism. And I read it, and I said, what's your response? And she said, I'm stunned. I'm absolutely stunned. But I think the average Catholic might say, well, that kind of surprises me, but I guess if it's there, the Pope must have approved it or whatever. 
Um, it's the same thing that we see going on in the church with what Rick Warren says, or what Beth Moore says, or with anybody that's in the David Jeremiah. So I wanted to underline the fact that this, it's Global Oneness Day. Um, earlier this year, I was in Kentucky, and I spoke um, at a church in Kentucky. And I was with the lawyer for Answers in Genesis, where we had spoken last year to their staff. And he said, would you like to see the ark that we're building? And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Answers in Genesis is building an ark. They're, they're, they're very, at very beginning stages, but it was interesting. And I told him, I said, you know, the New Age is building an ark. And it's metaphoric, but it's an ark of oneness. The Course in Miracles, Jesus said that the teachings of the Course in Miracles is like an ark of peace. It's an ark of safety. And in effect, it's an ark of oneness. The world is being told, if it wants to escape all of the problems and crises, if we want to push the Armageddon situation off of the spiritual map, get on the ark of oneness. And this, this is literally... Uh, what they call the Armageddon Alternative. I documented it in my book, um, False Christ Coming, Does Anybody Care? <coughs> the Armageddon Alternative says that if we all unite and recognize that we're all God because God and Christ are in everyone and everything, then we can have a planetary Pentecost and we can avert Armageddon. Well, it sounds good. And I mean, did Jesus tell us in Revelation through John that these things because he wanted to scare us, intimidate us, because he likes to be negative. No, he saw everything that was going on today, and he knew where it was going. And where it's going is that in order to achieve what they want to achieve, people calling themselves Christians one day uh, will be killed and persecuted in order to accomplish their objectives. And they have that in writing. I haven't emphasized it. I haven't gone over it. But just like in Mein Kampf, it's there. Neil Donald Walsh, who's one of the ones today on this Global uh, Oneness Day, one of the speakers, says that he had conversations with God. And, and his book was called Conversations with God, books one, two, and three. He's got a number of other books. Number one was on the bestseller list, number one, New York Times, for two and a half years. In book number two, his God told him that Hitler didn't end, Hitler didn't cause suffering, he ended suffering. He has amazing quotes in there that basically say that death is wonderful and that, and that they were really doing the Jews a favor. Oprah Winfrey had Neil Donald Walsh on her, pro, on her program that was recorded ahead of time, but they never aired it. And in a private uh, session where a friend of mine had attended where Walsh was present, he said that Oprah said to his staff that my people aren't ready for that two-hour interview with you yet. All this stuff is being very carefully doled out and has been going on for quite a long time. So the arc of oneness um, is the metaphor. I also wanted to just say that for those of you that occasionally you know, watch Joel Osteen, um, this is a quote on November 6th um, last year, uh, Joel Osteen uh, welcomed Oprah Winfrey to his church and he said the following to Oprah. And I hope you read those. I think you're all here before when I mentioned that the Course in Miracles Jesus that Oprah puts forth said that uh, slain Christ has no meaning. Don't make the pathetic or clinging to the old rugged cross. So Joel Osteen says to Oprah, awesome to have you. We're so honored to have you both here, she and whoever she was with, and we, our producer, I think. And we just celebrate and pray for you guys with what God is doing in your lives. Joel Osteen just doesn't really have a clue. You know, he, it's, he's really kind of like the Norman Vincent Peel. And Peel actually pulled from the occult uh, and, and uh, mentioned that one of the things he has in the power of positive thinking is God is in you. Another thing I wanted to mention is that if you were um, in the world and you wanted to listen on CD to A Course in Miracles, if you go online on Amazon, there is a man who recorded The Course in Miracles. And you might be surprised to know that it's John Boy and Walton. Richard Thomas is the one that reads The Course in Miracles. So you've got two of the most beloved figures in American culture. You know, Richard Thomas, John Boy Walton. It's been a little while since he's been on, but I think most of you remember him. And Oprah Winfrey. 
I mean, what a perfect way to get false teachings out to people. Another thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is there was a really good article by Dave Hunt in the Berean Call, and it was reprinted this year in April 2015. It's called Revival or Apostasy. And I think if you read it, it will underline a lot of the things that we've been talking about. We are not on the cusp of some great revival. Well, we're on the cusp of a great revival, but who's producing it and where is it going is the question. So uh, I want to bring that to your attention. And I think, I think that's just some of the loose ends that I wanted to bring up. So at the end of a conference like this, I think it's important that we step back and go, okay, that's a lot of... It's a lot of bad news, but it's also what we've been told would happen. And I think we celebrate the fact that the Bible is accurate, it's clear. I mentioned that when I came out of the New Age, I knew a lot about deception from, from the get-go because we had been a part of it. And I mentioned how I was spiritually attacked, if you will, by this man that came off the street and started screaming at me as I was reading Scripture for the first time in Johanna Michelson's book, The Beautiful Side of Evil, which I highly recommend. So that's part of the faith. We would go into churches. My wife and I would go into churches, and you know, um, a little old lady would come up to me, probably about my age now, and she would say, "Well, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, welcome to the church. I, are, are you are you saved?" So, I'd say, "Yes." Well, how long have you been saved? Oh, about thirty days. Oh, how did you come to the Lord? And we would tell her everything that happened and, and the spiritual warfare, and she said, "Well." Uh, the coffee and the donuts are right over there, and, and we're so glad to have you, Mr. Smith. And we would go home, and we would, we would, you know, we didn't know much of anything about the Bible, but we knew almost everything we needed to know about deception, because we'd already seen there's a false Christ. We would read Ephesians 6, we'd read 2 Thessalonians, Matthew 24, and we'd go, yeah, yeah, it's, it's all there. 1 Timothy 4, 1. We didn't know much else, and we would look, where is the church at? And finally, we went to this one church. And they had a guest pastor, and he said, you know, you guys saved, and well, here we go again, and we did the whole thing. And he looks right in my eyes and he goes, yeah, I can tell you some stories. And I went, whoa, he understands. And I think that's what we're all looking for. We're looking for, and I think you're very fortunate, you know, to have a body here that understands what's going on, and that you can, that you can work off of that. We don't have to talk about these things every minute of the day. But we need to know what's going on, at least in a general sense, and what the deception is. And this Armageddon alternative is what is being presented to the world, the Ark of Oneness. We need to remember that the book of Revelation is prophecy. It's going to happen. It's not going to be undone. I've heard Christian leaders talk about Nineveh and how God repented of, of what they said would happen about Nineveh being leveled. There was, there was no prophecy uttered in Nineveh. It wasn't this was prophecy. He said, you're going to be leveled. But they repented, and he, they repented, and he repented. And he, he pulled back on that. But we're, it's very clear in Revelation, this is not going to stop. What we're looking at right now, barring some incredible, miraculous intervention, and not a false revival, I don't care who says it or who's been impressed by God that this is going to happen, we need to be very prayerful and careful about what's coming because, it, again, it's going to be everything that the Bible warned about in terms of lying signs and wonders um, and, and about uh, the uh, apostasy that we're told is coming. So what I'd like to do is just look at what Scripture tells us in regards to how do we stand in the face of all this? What do we do? And... Um, <clears throat> Standing, being steadfast. Uh, therefore, my brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we, we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. He who endures unto the end shall be saved. We need to endure what's going to be coming down. We need to, and we're all doing that to some extent right now. Just a lot of you have left churches. A lot of you are wondering, you know, like, am I the only one? And I think you find a group like this, or you go online, or you find some of us that are hopefully encouraging you by telling us, telling you of our experiences. But it, it's, it's somewhat lonely, but yet it's not. 
we're finding each other. And I think when you find somebody that's gone through what you've gone through, it just confirms what, what Scripture talks about. Keeping. To keep is to hold fast, preserve, and maintain. We stand fast and remain steadfast by keeping God's Word. And I, I love Luke 11 and 28, but he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. We're not looking at that now. We're looking at Eugene Peterson. Okay, Second Peter 1, 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what Peterson translates that as? We weren't, you know, just wishing upon a star when we made known unto you the coming of that, that's more like Jiminy Cricket and a lot less a, a two-edged sword that tells you exactly a cunningly devised fable. Well, huh, the shack. That's a cunningly devised fable. It's got the Jesus in the shack saying God is in everyone and everything. Who's on the front cover of the shack endorsing it? Eugene Peterson. The one who says that we weren't, you know, just wishing on a star. So he eliminated cunningly devised fable and went ahead and endorsed one. The message is filled with things like that. It's a transitional Bible, just like Roger was showing the transition to Babylon through the Catholic Church, through the New Age, from the church, the emerging church. There's a transition to a New Age Bible, and the message, believe me, is one of those. It's a, what I really like the way the message says this, and what I say is, I really don't like the way the message says this, and this, and this. And does a little leaven leaven the whole lump or not? So we've talked about it before. You know, eat the meat, spit out the bones. That's one of it's just it's not a good thing to do. People choke on those bones. <laughs> Jesus answered and said to them, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now therefore, hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Continuing. To continue is to stay, abide, remain, stand. We do not change. Um Proverbs 24, 21. It says, meddle not with them that are given to change. What does Rick Warren call himself? A change agent. What does uh, Eugene Peterson, how does he translate that? He says, respect your leaders. Don't be mutinous or rebellious. He completely flipped that upside down. In other words, we're being warned about change agents like Rick Warren, but then Peterson comes in and says, respect Rick Warren. Don't be mutinous or rebellious. It's just another example of how things are being changed. John 8, 31, 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But I really like the Bible studies that this person has done, or this person was such a good Bible teacher. Is he continuing in the word? It says, if you continue in my word. A lot of the false teachers that are out there right now built up their reputation by being solid Bible teachers. So people are thinking, well, they've been a solid Bible teacher, so they still must be. What a great place for Satan to step in. And I think one of the primary examples right now is David Jeremiah. He's written a number of books on the end days. He wrote an excellent book called Invasion of Other Gods. He said that the New Age worldview is the most dangerous worldview to enter the church. You look through his most recent books over the last decade and see if you can see anything about the New Age. We were so concerned about it. Carol Matriciana, Johanna Michelson, and I wrote a letter through Carol Matriciana to David Jeremiah requesting a meeting, very nicely worded, commending him on his stand on the New Age teachings in the past, and saying that we would like to bring some important information to his attention. It took him two months. His secretary's secretary wrote back to Carol and said, uh, Dr. Jeremiah will not be able to meet with you. Meanwhile, he's bringing Roma down, a Catholic New Ager, into the church and basically saying, I endorse her. He brought it forward and says, I don't see anything here to be concerned about. Oh, really? Check out the booklet that my friend Greg Reed wrote on uh, Confused by an Angel on Roma Downey. It's unbelievable. She just marches into the church. I mean, the, the enemy doesn't even have to be subtle. They just march into the church. They get a stamp of approval for someone like David Jeremiah. So he's, we're seeing this on a widespread level. But David Jeremiah is such a good teacher. I see him. Whatever. You know, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. 2 Timothy 3.14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. 2 Timothy 3.14. Acts 14.21-22, And when they preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them 
to continue in the faith. That's what we're doing here. Continue in the faith, in the true gospel, not in this new emerging stuff that Roger has uh, gone through so uh, beautifully. It's, it's just nobody's saying too much. People are reading Jesus Calling and, well, you know, I wish my friend wasn't reading that. Well, you know, get up to speed. Just You don't have to have a whole book like I wrote on it, but just get a few points and ask a few good questions. Would it trouble you if you found out that some of the messages in Jesus Calling contradicted the Bible? Uh, well, yeah. Would you think that that's really Jesus talking? To, well, maybe not. I mean, we need to do more to, to try to consolidate the people that we have. We're trying to keep people from falling away. So our witnessing is within the church also. There's a cost. Luke 14, 28, 30, and 33. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether that whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation is not able to finish it all that he, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. We're watching people forsaking. And the other thing is we're making Christianity, like Rick Warren in The Purpose Driven Life, it's like, believe and receive, welcome to the church, God bless you, you're in the family, you're on your way to heaven. Now, I don't expect a pastor to necessarily say, well, um, before you come forward, let me just mention a couple of the things that Jesus said. He said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. They uh, they called me Beals of Over Satan, they're going to call you Beals of Over Satan. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute me. Now, if anybody wants to come forward, come on. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that we, we do that, but I think we're leaving that completely out and, you know, the book of Revelation, I think, was, you know, brought into the church about 60 years uh, in. And I think there's a reason for that. I think people need to get grounded. You know, we, we don't need to hit new believers with all this stuff, but we need to bring it in fairly quickly. This is not an easy walk. But yet the Lord upholds us and he walks with us. And he'll never leave us or forsake us. Enduring. To endure is to, re is to remain, to undergo, to bear trials, is to have fortitude, to persevere, abide, to take patiently, to suffer. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved, Matthew 24, 13. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Remember the example that we mentioned of Paul and Silas. I mean, are we going to, after being beaten and thrown in, the, thrown in jail and then put in stocks, are we going to be able to sing praise and, and, and psalms to the Lord? I mean... We need his help to do that. I don't know that I could do that very easily, but Lord, can you help me to rejoice in this situation? Because we're being told to suffer for him is, is, a, is an amazing thing. So I'm going to just run through, with the time that we have left, and just run through some of the things that the Bible says that's kind of, kind of tough, but yet when we hear the response and how we can respond to these things, I think it's uplifting. Number one, we're to expect trouble. Job 5, 7, yet man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. Mark 13, 8, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be earthquakes in diverse places. There shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. Biblical response, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Psalm 46, 1 to 3. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me, Psalm 86, 7. And then Jesus said, Let, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me, John 14, 1. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 10. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 10. And then I did a prayer using, you know, the word trouble. Psalm 25, 17, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. O bring, o bring thou me out of my distresses. By the way, this was supposed to be a booklet that would be available today. We didn't quite make it. But Lighthouse Trails will have this whole thing in a booklet form probably by the end of next week. Two, expect suffering. Philippians 1.29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. 
2 Corinthians 1 5 for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ the biblical response to suffering to wine like the Jesus of Jesus calling on December 25th in Jesus calling he says in his message to Sarah Young and to the readers who read this he says that the night of his birth uh, was a dark night for him it was a filthy stable and he was born under the most appalling conditions can you imagine that the Lord is barely out of Mary's womb and he's whining that's the Jesus of Jesus calling so our response is not to whine but to rejoice 1 Peter 4 13 but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy 1 Peter 4.16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this behalf. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. 1 Peter 2.19-20 Prayer have mercy upon me, O Lord, consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me, thou that liftest me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I will rejoice in thy salvation. Psalm 9, 13 to 14. 3. Expect grief and sorrow. Ecclesiastes 1.18, for in much wisdom is much grief. The more we learn about this stuff, the more we see it in Scripture, it's sad. And it's hard not to, I mean, I have a friend who just broke down crying. Not because he was weak emotionally, but because he just he's so taken back by what's going on. He was at the Parliament of World Religions, and he looked at the way the world's coming together. And folks, there is a lot of anger and hatred towards Bible-believing Christians. We're all feeling it. This is a different ballgame. Ecclesiastes 2, 23 For what hath man of all his labor and his vexations of his heart wherein he hath labored under the sun for all his days or sorrows and his travail grief? Yet his heart taketh not rest in the night. This also is vanity. Biblical response. Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Ecclesiastes 7, 3-4. Sorrow is better than laughter. Uh, I, that was one of the first things I noticed with the holy laughter. Sorrow is better than laughter. Sarah Young Jesus says that um, we're to laugh at the future. Laugh at the future. That sounds more like Rodney Howard Brown. Then Jesus, who said, you know, blessed are those that mourn, you know, woe to those that laugh now, blessed are those that mourn. 2 Corinthians 6.10, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things, 2 Corinthians 6.10. 2 Corinthians 7.10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Prayer. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief. Yea, my soul and my belly. Psalm 31, 9. Expect persecution. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a promise. You hear about all of God's promises. You don't usually see that one in there. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. John 15, 20. Here's the response, the biblical response. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, and men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. We need to remember these things. Matthew 5.44, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. 2 Corinthians 12.10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God said he would perfect his strength in our weakness. Psalm 119, Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. Getting persecuted and standing in awe, it's like, wow, this is exactly what you said would happen. So we're in awe of God's word while we're getting persecuted. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Prayer. Psalm 7, 1. O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. 5. Expect affliction. 
Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. People will say, well, what if you die? Is that being delivered? Spiritually, we are held up and we are, we are, we're okay. We, we may die for our faith someday. I mean, many people have. People are doing it right now. I think when, and I, I hope this never happens, but if all of a sudden we find somebody on a, on a washed up on a beach in Northern California that ISIS has had something to do with, it, all of a sudden people are going to go, whoa, it's going to really bring it home. I mean, we're pretty sober about what we're seeing, what they're doing over there, but that's over there. When this stuff starts to hit here. That man, no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. First Thessalonians 3.3. 3. Mark 13.19. For in those days shall be affliction, such as were not from the beginning of creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. The biblical response, 2 Corinthians 4.16.17. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 17. Psalm 9, 119, 50. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. This is one that is really interesting, and I apply it directly to myself, because when we were spiritually attacked, and I, I go into great detail in the light that was dark, but we were getting spiritually attacked before we were Christians, and we didn't know how to deal with it. And we we're not supposed to... There's, no evil. There's no devil. Um, you know, we didn't know what to do with it. We did every New Age solution. That was what John Michaelson's book told us. Call upon the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. And we did. And the evil left. And we went, whoa. And it, it took us a little while to put everything together, but it was like amazing. So this one, Psalm 119.71, it's good for me that I've been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Prayer. Turn thou unto me, and have mercy unto me, for I am desolate and afflicted. Psalm 25, 16. 6. Expect tribulation. Acts 14, 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. Biblical response. Deuteronomy 4, 30, 31. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swore unto them. John 16, 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us all in our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, 4. I remember years ago when the holy laughter thing was happening, I got a letter from some couple in Vermont, and they said, you know, we are just waiting for the time when all these things happen so that we will be available to help people understand what's going on, to comfort them, to explain to them these things all were talked about in the Bible. We're not to be surprised by these things. Prayer, 1 Samuel 26, 24, And behold, as thy life was as much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be as much set by the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. It's been a long day. <clears throat> Expect temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. I would suggest that those of you who might have been reading Jesus' calling are being shown by the Lord that any of us can get deceived. You can't ever be more deceived than my wife and I were. I was running around in orange clothing. I had a guru from India. You know, I mean, I was doing the Course in Miracles. You, you don't need to be, you don't need to feel bad. It's just, it just shows you how, you know, there's a way that seems right to man. I think Roger brought that quote up in his talk. But, but, but the end, end of it is death. So the, the important thing is to, is to be willing to be corrected, to take that step back on the trail. And to recognize that, wow, I can get deceived by this. I, I'm subject to flattery. I'm subject to things that aren't biblical. 
That's what the Lord, he's honing us, and he's honing us for these days that are coming. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Biblical response, Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. James 1, 2 to 3. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing that, this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And then James 1, 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Prayer. Matthew 6, 13, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. A. Expect trials, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, and whom having now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, 1 Peter 1, 7-8. Our faith is evidence of things not seen, not things that are experienced. Can we experience God? Well, yeah. This is not common, though. This is not really the way he's doing things. I mean, we've all had things that we can attribute to having some kind of experience with God. But we're being told by today's leaders that if you're not having an encounter, they say, have you had an, have you had an encounter with God lately? You haven't? Is everything okay at home? You know, I mean, that's the, the pressure. Um, Bill Hybels, having the guts to respond. Wait a second, you better make sure who you're responding to before you respond or you're walking right into a, uh, an open door. Biblical response. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed you may be glad with exceeding joy. Prayer. Psalm 25.20 Oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Mine expect deception. We've gone through that, all those scriptures. Um, and uh, in Revelation, there are two references that indicate that the whole world is going to be deceived. Wow. The whole world is going to be deceived. Biblical response, 2 Timothy 3, 13 to 14. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. When I was in the New Age, I would say every day and every way, things are getting better and better. Now that I'm a positive Christian, I say every day and every way, things are getting worse and worse. But that's not my opinion. That's scripture. Prayer. Psalm 141.9, keep me from the snares which they have laid for me and the gins of the workers of iniquity. Ten, expect lying wonders to try and trump God's word. We've covered that pretty completely. The biblical response is 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Prove all things. Examine yourself to make sure you're in the faith. Acts 17.11, the Bereans were commended for seeing if what was being said was so. Searching the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Psalm 119.16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. And then the prayer, Psalm 119, 133 to 134, order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of man so I will keep thy precepts. This is one that I'm really noticing a lot right now. Expect hatred. 1 John 3.13, Jesus said, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. But Jesus loves everybody. Yes, he does. But the world hates Jesus. And because they hated him, they're going to hate those that follow him. He told us that. It comes with the faith. Luke 21, 17. And this is very important. And he shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Uh, actually, the next one, Matthew 24, 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and they shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Can you imagine if all of humanity connects, we all agree, except for Bible-believing Christians, that God is in everyone and everything, but we refuse to be a part of that. They will say, and they are saying, that we are hindering world peace because we're pulling, we're not recognizing that we're God, so we're like a cancer cell in the body of God, which is the body of humanity. That's all in writing. So we need to be healed or eliminated. 
It's all in writing, just like Mein Kampf. Biblical response, blessed are ye when men shall hate you and they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the man, son of man's sake. And this is what's so amazing. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. Can you, can you imagine that? Oh, everybody really hates me. We start leaping for joy. I mean, that's what we're being told. It's like, Lord, can you please help me to leap for joy? Because I don't know if I can do that Matthew 5, 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them, and curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Prayer, Psalm 69, 14, deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me do be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. 12, expect betrayal. Matthew 24, 10, and then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another. We're seeing this, I'm sure you have family experiences where, you know, Husbands and wives are, are taking exception on issues. Kids are getting, they're, they're going up to Bethel and the parents are aghast. Um, people are getting mad and angry and uh, it, it, it just, it's a really sad thing. But the biblical response, for the son dishonoreth the father, the, water, the daughter riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Where would I go but to the Lord? Luke 21, 16, 17. And, he that, and ye shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall be caused to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. In your patience possess ye your souls. And that sounds pretty extreme, but I can really see this. I can, you know, when you see the, the world really thinks it's on the cusp of a, of a, of a new worldview that's going to underline a new world religion and we're hindering that, all nations will be hating us for not going along with that. Prayer, Psalm 3010, Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. 13, expect attempts to make you ashamed. Luke 9, 26, For whoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Luke 9, 26. I would not want to be Eugene Peterson standing in front of the Lord. I mean, talk about taking God's word and just thrashing it. Dave Hunt, he made a statement in one of his brilliant call newsletters about the message. He said, who does this man think he is that he can just trash God's word? He sat down either at home or somewhere and, and rewrote the Bible. Unbelievable. In the old days, scribes would just meticulous make sure every jot, every tittle. That's why we have the Word of God. Peterson, nah. and who's endorsed it? The, the message? Rick Warren, they, uh, Billy Graham, David Jeremiah, Beth Moore. Beth Moore has a big apology for the message and why they use it and, and endorses it. Biblical response, Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Prayer. Psalm 25, 2 to 3. O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. 14. Expect attempts to make you fearful. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Biblical response to Timothy 1, 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We all get fearful sometimes. That's our humanness. Lord, help not to be fearful in this situation. Perfect your strength and my weakness. Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 118, 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do to me. Prayer, Psalm 64, 1, hear my voice, O God, in my prayer, preserve my life from the fear of the enemy. 15, expect attempts to make you weary and faint. Jeremiah 12, 5, if thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? That's where we're at, the swelling of Jordan. That's Jeremiah 12, 5. Biblical response, Judges 8, 4. And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over. He and the other 300 men that were with him, faint yet pursuing them. 
We hear a lot about strength in numbers. Oneness is a broad way, it's everyone. Is that the lesson of Gideon and the soldiers? How many were sent back? It was like, it was, like, was it 30,000 and 29,700 were sent back? Something like that. They had 300 left. Because God knew that humanity would take credit for coming together and bringing world peace. <coughs> the way is narrow, few there be that find it. Prayer, Psalm 27, 11 to 12. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, but for false witnesses are risen up against me, such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This world is not our home. It is not our home, and I think we're, we're, we're learning that. I live in the California mountains. Pine trees that have been beautifully existing for 80, 90 years are turning brown. And I don't mean one or two. We've watched it. Just started off one or two, then a grove. Now there are whole hillsides that are just trashed. I mean, we haven't had water for like four years. The drought's been on. And I think it's very symbolic of what we're watching in the church. It's happening very quickly. 16, expect to be called Beals above or Satan. Matthew 10, 25. Jesus said, it's enough for the disciple to be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beals above, how much more shall they call him of his household? Biblical response, Matthew 5, 11, and 12. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Prayer, Psalm 31, 15. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. There's a couple more. Um, expect spiritual warfare. That comes with the hatred and everything else. Um, and I want to do this one. Expect that you may die for your faith. Psalm 44:22. Yea, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. John 16, 1-2. Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God's service. I can honestly see how the world will think it's doing God a favor by getting rid of cancer cells that refuse to acknowledge the divinity of humanity. That's kind of a quick thing to just kind of lay on you, but it's documented pretty clearly in my book. It's just, that's just the way it is. The Armageddon alternative requires every single cell, every person in the body of God, which is humanity, to connect. And if you refuse to do that connection, you are literally a cancer cell. You are hindering world peace. And it says that Antichrist, will, uh, by just peace, will destroy many. And it says he will destroy wonderfully. It's going to look good. Jesus' calling looks good to a lot of people. <clears throat> Biblical response, Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in the hell. Psalm 116, 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 48, 14, for, for this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Prayer, Psalm 23, 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I saw men lined up on a beach just before ISIS beheaded them. And somebody showed me this picture just before I went up to speak in uh, Vancouver, Canada. And I can't, I can't explain it. I don't know. But I looked at their faces. And I just, I, I was just overwhelmed. They just looked solid. And their stories, like there was one man that was not a believer, and he basically said, "I'm with them." It was like he was so impressed by the fact that you know that they had stood their ground in their faith and had not denied Christ. And we've heard stories like that at Columbine and other places. And expect to see Jesus. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.7, behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Revelation 1.7, Matthew 24.27, as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Biblical response, Luke 12.37, blessed are those servants whom the, uh, whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Luke 21, 25 to 28, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Prayer. Revelation twenty two twenty. He which testifieth these things say, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And then expect a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, that's Revelation 21, 1 to 2. And Revelation 21, 7. The response, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And the conclusion, life can be extremely difficult and challenging. It's not easy being a biblical Christian. If we continue in his word and remain steadfast in our faith, we are promised trials and tribulation. We know that we will be mocked, hated, betrayed, persecuted, maybe even killed for our faith. We are not to be deterred by a world and an apostate church that would seek to undo our testimony. Even in our most trying moments, we are encouraged to rejoice and be thankful as we glorify God and exhort one another daily to be steadfast in our faith until the very end. Rejoice evermore, 1 Thessalonians 5.16. We know what an overcomer is. The charge, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work, John 9.4. And Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. When we grow weary and faint, we must remember that our strength comes from the Lord. He will renew us for the task at hand. His grace is sufficient, and he perfects his strength in our weakness. As we are strengthened and encouraged, we must encourage others that God's word is true, and that his truth will prevail in the end. Evil will be vanquished, and those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. And then 2 Corinthians 12, 9, just as we wrap up. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then Isaiah 40, 28, 31, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, 28, 31. And finally, Psalm 92, 7, 13. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. Mine eye also shall see my desire of my enemies, and my ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Psalm 92, 7, 13. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. You magnify your word above your name. Your word is what we depend upon, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the encouragement that it brings in this darkness that we find ourselves wrapped up into, from the church that's calling itself the Christian church, but is moving into a Babylonian church. We just ask you, please, to strengthen us and to help us to convey the hope that we have in you to those that will be open enough to listen to us. Help us to not be ignorant of our enemy's devices, but help us not to overemphasize what's going on and to remember to rejoice forevermore. And in everything, give thanks, for this is your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.